Chapter 4. Los Alamos. It was some time afterward when the thought flashed upon my mind, that the disturbances I had observed might be due to an intelligent control. Although I could not decipher their meaning, it was impossible for me to think of them as having been entirely accidental. The feeling is constantly growing on me that I had been the first to hear the greeting of one planet to another. Nikola Tesla, Talking with the Planets, Collier's Weekly, March 1901. The selection of the Los Alamos National Laboratory near Santa Fe, New Mexico, as the site to house the alien found alive at the Corona crash site, seemed at first glance to be rather strange, and inappropriate. At the time of the Roswell crash in July 1947, less than two years after the two atomic bombs had been dropped on Japan, and only four years after it was founded, the Los Alamos laboratory was still somewhat primitive. Originally the Los Alamos Ranch School, a private school for boys who wanted to live an outdoor life, it was selected by J. Robert Oppenheimer, the director of the Manhattan Project, and approved by General Leslie Groves, and then was commandeered by the Army in November 1942, for the express purpose of designing and developing the atomic bomb. That is to say, it was officially condemned by the government, so that the property could be acquired pursuant to a military purpose. In order to allow the boys to finish the fall semester, Secretary of War Henry Stimson agreed to wait until February 8, 1943, to take possession. During the war, it was staffed primarily by high-level theoretical physicists, from several different countries. Immediately after the war, in the fall of 1945, the scientific ranks were severely reduced, as the major nuclear scientists returned to academia and corporate consulting, and the lower-level workers left to pursue advanced degrees. Oppenheimer resigned a few weeks after the war ended, to become director of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and Norris Bradbury succeeded him as the director in October 1945. By spring of 1946, only 1,200 staff members remained, as Bradbury sought to define the new civilian role of the laboratory in the post-war world, now working closely with the NASA Atomic Energy Commission. But the exclusive focus of the laboratory in the new era continued to be the development of atomic weaponry. According to the Los Alamos website, by the late 1940s, funding was secured to rebuild the main technical area, and improve housing, as the laboratory refined and tested fission weapons and gradually expanded the hydrogen bomb research program. Two test series, Operations Crossroads and Sandstone, were conducted in 1946 and 1948, respectively. Six nuclear weapons tests were conducted in the 1940s, allowing the nation's stockpile to grow from two bombs, in late 1945, to 170 in 1949. Interestingly, Major Jesse Marcel, the base security officer at Roswell, had been the Army security officer for Operation Crossroads conducted at the Bikini Atoll. There is no evidence that any other type of R&D was conducted at the laboratory in that period. Given the limited resources available to him during the late 1940s, it seems highly improbable that Bradbury was financially able to pursue any other type of research. Los Alamos National Laboratories, Present Day It seems that the most important rationale for sending the sole alien survivor of the Roswell crash to Los Alamos in 1947, must have been based on trying to learn whatever they could about the advanced technology incorporated into the alien craft, and whatever other scientific information he could give them. Certainly, the theoretical physicists at the laboratory would have been most capable of comprehending that information, and possibly converting it to useful human technology. In a more perfect world, an unexpected visitor from another planet might have been sent to a top university, where Earth academicians would have attempted to learn about his home world. But, only two years after a brutal, devastating war, and with the military expecting another one, advanced technology adaptable to weaponry was the main preoccupation of the U.S. government. Paranoia superseded civilized curiosity. But from another viewpoint, that paranoia may have been fully justified, since we knew nothing about the aliens' motives. After all, this craft was evidently scrutinizing the most sensitive military installation in the world. If an alien civilization was contemplating an invasion of Earth, it would certainly begin by checking out the most powerful military capability of the most powerful nation on the planet. It is supremely logical that the military would have come to that conclusion, and that possibility alone justified sending the alien to Los Alamos. In fact, as more and more of the secret information about the Roswell crash emerged over time, 
it began to appear that the alien craft may indeed have been conducting a spy mission, in advance of some sort of mass landing. Army Colonel Philip Corso apparently believed that when he wrote in his book, The Day After Roswell, the real truth behind a 50-year history of a war that looked like the ultimate defeat of humankind, can now finally be told because we prevailed. It was because in the dark hours before dawn in July 1947, the Army, only dimly recognizing that we were on the edge of a potential cataclysmic event, pulled the crashed spacecraft out of the desert, and harvested its parts, just like the inhabitants of that vehicle wanted to harvest us. This dramatic supposition was evidently based on a top-secret report, that human body parts had been found on the crashed alien craft. And then, of course, there were the security considerations. Since the government had immediately decided, right after the crash, to keep the entire matter in top-secret containment, the site chosen to host the alien had to be extremely secure, and no facility was more secure at that time, than the home of the Manhattan Project. That requirement alone ruled out a university location. Even the Pentagon itself, which was only four years old in 1947, did not have as high a level of security as Los Alamos in those early years, since the Pentagon was right in the middle of a very busy section of northern Virginia. By contrast, the only entrance to Los Alamos was over a single mountain road, tucked inside a canyon. The major concern in dealing with the alien was, first and foremost, communication. And evidently, it was believed that if the most brilliant scientists in the country could not learn to communicate with the ET, then nobody could. Furthermore, once the alien was in a secure location, other, more appropriate language personnel could be brought in as needed, to facilitate communication and interaction. And they, of course, would be thoroughly investigated, and made to sign security oaths before gaining admission. MJ-12 decided to refer to the Roswell aliens as Ebens. This was simply an unimaginative derivation of EB, standing for Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. After being comfortably ensconced at Los Alamos, the alien, who was given the designation EB-1 by MJ-12, willingly cooperated in attempting to overcome the communication barrier. But the language differences were huge, and seemed insurmountable, as shown in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Steven Spielberg's 1977 movie, the Eben language consisted of tonal variations, and sounded almost musical. One contributor to the Serpo website described it as high-pitched singing. Some of the sounds were not even reproducible by the Americans, for the entire five-year period that EB-1 remained alive, he was only able to teach the Los Alamos scientists about 30% of the even language. Anonymous reported that complex sentences and numbers could not be recognized. EB-1 identified a piece of equipment found intact on the alien craft, as a communications device for sending and receiving messages from his home planet, and he showed the scientists how to use it, but they couldn't get it to work. So, no communications with his planet were possible for five years, until just prior to his death in the summer of 1952, when one of the scientists realized that the device had to be powered by the energy source on the alien craft. When they tried that, it worked. What is very surprising about this is the fact that it was an earthling who figured that out, not the alien. EB-1 just wasn't very smart. Anonymous tells us that EB-1 was a mechanic. He wasn't a scientist. Once the connection was made, the alien commenced sending messages to his planet. During the summer of 1952, he sent six messages, all of which were successfully transmitted. He was able to roughly translate the messages into English for the benefit of the Los Alamos scientists. EB-1 did receive some replies to his messages, but they were replies that only he understood. His attempted translations were confusing. Apparently, his planet agreed to a return visit but the date they specified was over 10 years away. Our people concluded that this must have been a mistake, but they were unable to obtain a clarification before EB-1 died in the late summer of 1952. In a parenthetical note from Anonymous about the exchange suggestion in Message 5, he says, It is believed, but not documented, that EB-1's U.S. military caretaker had suggested to EB-1 that an exchange program be set up, which would allow our people to visit an exchange culture, scientific information, and collect astronomical data during a space trip by an American military team, or what eventually became known as the team members. As noted above, EB-1 did indeed make that suggestion, but apparently there was no reply to that message. 
That proposal for an exchange program this early in the game was evidently, purely in the interests of intelligence, and not goodwill, since the apparent spy mission of the aliens, and the discovery of human body parts on the spacecraft very likely caused us to view the Ebins as potential invaders, even though we already knew that they were not human flesh eaters. Nevertheless, that discovery probably created sufficient distrust for us, to want to obtain inside information about this race, that dropped onto our planet out of the skies. After all, they were caught stealthily gathering information about our military capability, instead of landing at the United Nations in Manhattan, and asking to be taken to our leader. Furthermore, they had the technology to reach our planet, and be assured, we were going to do whatever it took to get our hands on that technology. So, if we were able to walk around on their planet, and they were willing to let us visit, we were going to go there. The fact that the suggestion originally came from the military caretaker, strongly implies that the proposal was based on a military consideration. After the death of EB-1, the Los Alamos scientists continued to try to establish communication with the Eben's planet. They had a lexicon of the Eben written language to work from, provided by EB-1. According to the DIA information, the scientists sent several messages in 1953, that went unanswered. And then, after an intense, 18-month effort to improve their syntax, they sent two messages in 1955, and we finally received a reply. This was an amazing breakthrough for our planet, and an incredible accomplishment by the scientists. We had begun an actual dialogue with an alien civilization, across a vast ocean of space. Far more significant than the accomplishments of Guglielmo Marconi, and Alexander Graham Bell, if this event had not been so secret, it would have generated huge headlines in all the major newspapers of the world. One can imagine the celebratory scene at the laboratory when that first alien message appeared on the communication device. Now came the job of translation. Unaided, the scientists could only comprehend about 30% of the message. However, with the help of language specialists from both U.S. and foreign universities, they were able to translate most of the messages. Based on the probability that the Ebens are smarter than we are, the scientists then decided to send a reply in English, hoping the Ebens would find it easier to translate our language. They received a reply in broken English about four months later. The aliens didn't understand the concept of verbs, so their message contained only nouns and adjectives. It took several months for us to figure out the English reply. It became clear that if we sent them some basic English lessons, it might be possible to carry on a productive dialogue much faster, than if we had to continue to labor over their impossibly cryptic language. This was done, and six months later Los Alamos received another English message that was much more comprehensible. They were catching on, but according to Anonymous, Ebens were confusing several different English words, and still failed to complete a proper sentence. But it was an auspicious beginning. The Ebens now had the basics for English communication. Certainly, if they had the ability to travel throughout the galaxy and interact with other civilizations, they could decipher the rules of a language that human fifth graders mastered routinely. Very sensibly, the Ebens then sent us a compendium of their alphabet, with what they believed to be corresponding English letters. This was turned over to the university linguists, working with the Los Alamos scientists. Our language specialists struggled with it, and had a very difficult time. It took another five years before we acquired a basic understanding of the Eben language, and the Ebens became somewhat haltingly able to communicate in English. During that five-year period, which constituted the final years of the Eisenhower administration, the scientists continued to seek to arrange a return visit of the Ebens to Earth. Apparently, the desire for another visit was mutual. It appeared that we both wanted to establish some sort of diplomatic relationship. As previously mentioned, while we, especially our scientists, were no doubt motivated by high-minded sociological and scientific interests, our government officials and military and intelligence people, were suspicious of the aliens' intentions, and were more concerned with understanding their advanced technology, particularly as it applied to weaponry. We were probably still hopeful that a return visit would lead to an exchange program. It will be recalled that this was proposed by EB-1 in his fifth message, at our prompting, but if he did receive a reply agreeing to this, he wasn't able to translate it for us. Very probably, the aliens had the same goals we can safely conclude that they were very much interested in our atomic bombs. As we later learned while on their planet, they had not developed atomic energy, 
although they did have the more powerful particle beam weaponry, and had used it in war. Furthermore, the Ebens wanted to retrieve the bodies of their dead comrades. This involved some complications. While we did keep the remains of the bodies frozen at Los Alamos, using some very advanced cryonic technology, Anonymous says that we performed autopsies on four of the five dead aliens found at the Corona crash site. This was probably explained to them, but should not have surprised or shocked them at all. In fact, they probably expected it, and, as we later learned on Serpo, the Ebens had a rather ghoulish biotechnology research operation of their own, that went far beyond simple autopsies. Planning the return visit turned out to be much more complicated than we had expected. We were unable to understand their date and time system, and they could not comprehend ours. We sent them all the details of our planetary rotation and revolution, how we marked dates and time, and precisely where we were at the moment we sent the data. But the Ebens were never able to understand our system. Finally, by 1960, we figured out theirs, and we were able to send them longitude and latitude coordinates that we thought they could understand, however, we couldn't be sure. In early 1962 we developed a better arrangement. Anonymous says, we then decided to just send pictures showing the Earth, landmarks, and a simple numbering system for time periods. They allowed us to select a date, and we chose April 24, 1964. Selecting a landing location proved to be even more complex. The military planners wanted to make absolutely certain that security would not be compromised, and that the press or the public would not even get a hint of what was going on. At first they considered remote islands, but then realized that unusual movements of naval vessels could arouse suspicion. They decided that the site had to be controlled by the military to ensure complete secrecy. Finally, they settled on the southern end of the White Sands Missile Range, near Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. Holloman was previously known as Alamogordo Army Airfield, a training site for 8th Air Force bombardment crews during World War II. They also selected a fake location on the base itself, to misdirect interest. These decisions were made, and confirmed by the Ebens, in March 1962. It had taken 10 years from the time of the death of EB-1 to arrive at this historic agreement. This long-range planning schedule is somewhat surprising, since the Ebens must have had a mother ship already in orbit around Earth, and consequently must have been able to send scout ships to the surface without delay. Certainly, that tiny six-man craft that crashed near Roswell did not travel to Earth by itself, over 38 light-years from the Zeta Reticuli system, which we later determined to be their home constellation. And if a mother ship had remained in orbit around our planet after the Roswell crash, why was it not possible for the Ebens to just send another scout craft to the surface, to arrange the formal rendezvous directly? Certainly, MJ-12 and the government must have wondered about that, and must have asked that question over the communication device at an early stage in the interplanetary dialogue. This brings up the possibility that this did indeed happen, that some negotiations may have ensued without the subsequent knowledge of the DIA, the agency that ultimately released the SERPO material in 2005. This should come as no surprise, since the DIA did not exist in 1953. The Defense Intelligence Agency was created by President John F. Kennedy's Secretary of Defense, Robert S. McNamara, in October 1961. Consequently, whatever happened between the Roswell crash in July 1947, and the advent of the DIA in 1961, could only have been known to them from information they were able to gather after their creation, from top-secret Army and Air Force intelligence sources, operating under President Eisenhower. And it would be fair to conclude, that these military intelligence agencies were not very happy about having to turn this information over, to a brand new intelligence agency, created by a new, young, democratic president, who planned to replace them by combining all their functions under a single umbrella organization. Consequently, they were probably not very cooperative, and may have provided incomplete information, or possibly even disinformation, about the era when Eisenhower was president. Most likely, they convinced MJ-12 itself not to share that intelligence with the DIA, in the interests of compartmentalization. As will be seen in Chapter 5 this is probably exactly what happened, since we now know that the Ebens did send another scout craft to Earth on May 20, 1953. And that craft did not crash, it landed. Evidently, those messages that were sent in early 1953 must have been answered after all, 
but the DIA was not informed about this when the agency joined the project in 1962.